Hey everyone, welcome back to It's Too Late to Apologize Book Reviews. I'm Stella, and today we're going to be talking about Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. So Blood Meridian was published in 1985 and is considered a Western or anti-Western. Blood Meridian at first received subdued critical and commercial reception, but has since been recognized as McCarthy's masterpiece and one of the greatest American novels of all time. Because this is a contemporary work, I'll avoid any major spoilers, so I don't ruin the novel for anyone watching this before they read it. Blood Meridian is loosely based on the Glanton Gang, a historical group of scalp hunters hired by Mexican authorities to track and kill bands of Apache in northern Mexico and what is today the American Southwest. After the war in the summer of 1849, Glanton and his men embarked upon their mercenary career as scalpers, but quickly began attacking peaceful aboriginals and Mexican citizens alike to claim more bounties. By December of the same year, the state of Chihuahua placed a bounty on the gang and declared them outlaws. This story, though, is told through the kid and his experience with the Glanton gang. The kid comes from Tennessee and runs away from home at 14 to get away from his father. He first crosses paths with Judge Holden in a large tent where a congregation listens to a reverend preach. The judge calls the priest a pedophile among other things, and the Reverend is chased out of town by the heavily armed congregation. While being accused, the Reverend says, with tears in his eyes, this is him, the devil, here he stands. <laughs> the Reverend nailed it on page seven, people. Page seven, damn. Judge Holden, or the judge, as he's usually called, is Glanton's second in command. The kid runs into some bad luck and ends up joining the gang, not of his choice, but to avoid a worse fate. And so the kid joins a gang of sadistic mercenaries on a scalping mission of such appalling violence, it's of biblical proportions. To say Blood Meridian is the most violent thing I've ever read rings true, yet also kind of feels like a lie. I've read a lot of books about war and the Holocaust, and so I've read plenty about violence. But this book, while being based on historical events, is also a work of fiction. And it's definitely the most violent work of fiction I have ever read. It was so violent at times, it was difficult to read past the literal sense of the tragedy and to try and see what McCarthy is trying to say about violence and God, as it feels so senseless most of the time. But I think that's the point. Most violence is senseless, if not all. There was this really interesting connection between the decline of God and lawlessness of the southern border with Mexico in 1850 that Cormac McCarthy is exploring and the violent clash between the Americans, Mexicans, African Americans, and Aboriginal people of the area. But Glanton's men are also a mixture of white, black, Aboriginal, and Mexican men. So all are guilty of the bloodbath. None can claim innocence. There is a sense that fatherlessness and the loss of authority, be it spiritual, secular, or of fathers, is what leads to chaos and violence. At least, I think that's what McCarthy was saying. But even though there feels to be this decline of God, Mexicans, who are quite religious, are the ones who hired Blanton to hunt down the Apache. And while one may feel sympathy for the Apache, the descriptions of what the Apache do to those they come upon, be it children, women, babies, anyone, is a grisly form of torture not to be excused either. During the story, we encounter several derelict churches and towns in ruin, and in those places there is no resistance to Glanton's men. It almost feels like an apocalyptic novel at many times. Anywhere they encounter a functional church, which you could also equate as order, they also encounter resistance and even lose some of their men when their chaos is set loose among the town. There is a former priest who is one of Glanton's men, and it's this guy who's constantly looking out for the kid. He is the only one who cautions the kid against the other men and especially the judge. The former priest reveals to the kid that all the men that ride with Glanton have said that they have met the judge prior to joining with them. And one wonders if this is some cruel twist of fate or prophecy that the former priest shares as we know this has also happened to the kid also. And Glanton and the judge are always asking the former priest to do certain acts because this is another way for them to push back against order or religion and the nobility of man. And even how the former priest's story ends is indicative of God's perceived presence, which is ambiguous. Now the judge is much like Lucifer from Paradise Lost. That's what he reminded me of. He's huge, seven foot tall, a giant among men, intelligent and the most dynamic character in the novel by far. And that kind of reminds me of 
Faust, Mephistopheles, he was definitely the most engaging character in the whole entire novel. The judge can also practically perform magic by creating gunpowder out of guano, urine, and volcanic dirt. His knowledge almost seems like a form of magic to the men. The judge wants to control everything, but hates the freedom that God has given to his creations. The judge wrote on and then folded the ledger shut and laid it to one side and pressed his hands together and passed them down over his nose and mouth and placed a palm down on his knees. Whatever exists, he said, whatever in creation exists, without my knowledge, exists without my consent. He looked about the dark forest in which they were biovacked. He nodded towards the specimens he'd collected. These anonymous creatures, he said, may seem little or nothing in the world, yet the smallest crumb can devour us. Any smallest thing beneath yon rock, out of men's knowing, only nature can enslave man, and only when the existence of each last entity is routed and made to stand naked before him will he be properly suzerain of the earth. What's a suzerain? A keeper. A keeper or overlord. Why not say keeper then? Because he is a special kind of keeper. A suzerain rules even where there are other rulers. His authority countermands local judgment. Toadvine spat. The judge placed his hands on the ground. He looked at his inquisitor. This is my claim, he said. And yet, everywhere upon it are pockets of autonomous life. Autonomous. In order for it to be mine, nothing must be permitted to occur upon it, save by my dispensation. The judge wants to be God, just like Lucifer in Paradise Lost. And to him, and to the judge, war is God. One imagines what might have happened if the judge had used his intellect for good instead of chaos. Like, damn. Glenn's men find old apple and pomegranate trees, as if to say this was once Eden. And at one point, the kid stumbles out of the unforgiving mountains alone and finds himself at a lone burning tree in the empty desert, like Moses on Mount Sinai. The kid's character is ambiguous because I think he's either the representation of all men or of the United States of America. Young, naive, running from his father, and inherently good amongst the corrupted wills of others. The kid leaves the burning tree, the representation of God, and follows after the judge, the representation of Lucifer, because he sees it as his best chance of survival in the moment. And perhaps all men feel that same way when faced with a difficult choice, to follow the path of God or Lucifer. Compared to the other men in Glanton's gang, the kid is good. Whenever Glanton's men go scalping, the kid's perspective is almost lost amongst the carnage, as if he takes no part in it. But he is not innocent of it. Several times he chooses to show mercy, and it is this that makes the judge take notice of him. For me, one of the most interesting scenes is where the kid sees a group of pilgrims reenacting the procession to Calvary, where Jesus carries the cross before his crucifixion. The following day, he comes upon these pilgrims who have all been brutally slaughtered in the desert, and we don't know by whom. They die as a sacrifice for the sins of all. But there is no redemption. He sees an old woman sitting on a rock, and he goes to her. The company of Pentients lay hacked and butchered among the stones in every attitude. Many lay about the fallen cross, and some were mutilated, and some were without heads. Perhaps they gathered under the cross for shelter, but the hole into which it had been set, and the cairn of rocks about its base, showed how it had been pushed over and how the hooded altar Christ had been cut down and disemboweled, who now lay with the scraps of rope by which he had been bound, still tied about his wrists and ankles. The kid rose, and looked about this desolate scene, and then he saw alone and upright in a small niche in the rocks an old woman kneeling in a faded rebezo, with her eyes cast down. He made his way among the corpses, and stood before her. She was very old, and her face was gray and leathery, and sand had collected in the folds of her clothing. She did not look up. The shawl that had covered her head was much faded of its color, yet it bore a patent woven into the fabric, the figures of stars and quarter moons and other insignia of provenance unknown to him. He spoke to her in a low voice. He told her that he was an American and that he was a long way from the country of his birth and that he had no family and that he had traveled much and seen many things and had been at war and endured hardships. He told her that he would convey her to a safe place some party of her country people who would welcome her, and that she would join them, for he could not leave her in this place or she would surely die. He knelt on one knee, resting the rifle before him like a staff. 
Abuelita, he said. No puedes escucharme. He reached into the little cove and touched her arm. She moved, slightly, her whole body light and rigid. She weighed nothing. She was just a dried shell, and she had been dead in that place for years. And as I read that now, it feels as if he is a man at prayer or confession. This is the most that the kid speaks in the entire novel to any character. Well, there was one moment that earlier in the novel where he had spoken to some authorities and told a lot of their story. But in this moment, he is not, he doesn't need to do any of that. This is, he is sharing his story because he feels the need to gain this woman's trust. This is the most the kid speaks in the entire novel to any character. The kid barely says two words for the entire thing. But here he tells this old woman the story of his life and tells her that he will see her to safety, that she can trust him, only for him to discover that she has been long dead. He is too late. There is nothing to save, or perhaps there is no safety. Whether his confession has been heard is again ambiguous. He carries around a Bible he cannot read and does not understand. But that reverend in the beginning of the book, back on page six, said that the Son of God would follow one always, even until the end of the road, even if you don't ask for it. He will be there for you every step of the way. And perhaps that is what both the priest and the Bible represent for the kid. There is so much symbolism throughout this novel, and I'm sure every consecutive time one reads this book, they will find more. But in the end, there is no escape from violence and chaos for man. It is always dancing in the shadow, ready to consume the unsuspecting fools who follow him, or those who are not ready for him or see him for what he is. This is him, the devil. Here he stands. And the more I ponder this novel, the deeper it gets, which is a true sign of a great work. And I have to say that while this wasn't an enjoyable read, it's become one of the most profound novels I've ever read because it has so much to say in such an interesting, thought-provoking way. It's not heavy-handed. It's done in such a realistic way that really makes you think about things. And, and it's in the beauty of the execution that McCarthy really makes a person think about what he is trying to say. But have you read this novel? What are your thoughts? I would love to hear some different perspectives to help me discover all the things I missed after only having read this novel once. Leave me some comments down below. Please like and subscribe so more people can discover some of these great books. And I'll see you in the next video.